Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, have uh, you ever used one of those power washers? It's just plain old water, but with enough power, that water can knock out all kinds of grime and dirt, and, and those puppies kind of make even monotonous chores a little bit fun. Sometimes in, in order to really get something clean, you need serious power. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus too has come to cleanse. And don't worry, he's got plenty of authority and power to truly cleanse. Last week, this, this lesson follows right after last week, and it kind of goes to show exactly what Jesus had said he was going to do, he would be doing. Jesus had told the hometown, expectant hometown crowd, that he would not perform miracles upon demand. He would not perform miracles upon demand because the miracles were intended for a purpose, which was clearly stated in Isaiah 61, to proclaim good news to the poor, to set prisoners free, to give sight to the blind, and to deliver liberty to the oppressed. The crowd in Nazareth, on the other hand, wanted proof or perhaps a favor because Jesus grew up there. But Jesus came to heal, not to entertain or glorify himself. But immediately following that example, today's reading also makes it abundantly clear that Jesus did, in fact, do miracles and uh, lots of them. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus has a flurry of miracles. He, he starts by casting out demons, then he heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law, and, and after the sun is set, because it's the Sabbath, all kinds of people he healed and cast out many demons. Interestingly, though, it starts at the same place that last week's lesson did. It starts at the synagogue. In other words, it really starts with Jesus' preaching and teaching. The miracles themselves, well, they didn't start until someone with an unclean spirit in the synagogue taunts Jesus, saying, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, why would a demon do something like this? It almost seems counterproductive uh, at first glance, but it, perhaps it's as simple as this. The demons didn't like the preaching and teaching, and wanted to interrupt or cause a disturbance. Desperate to interrupt this dangerous preaching of our Lord, the demon might have decided that any distraction was the lesser of, well, two goods. Or it's also possible the demon was trying to rally the crowd. Perhaps the crowds would have heard this ta these taunts differently or sympathetically. Maybe the man possessed by that unclean spirit wasn't entirely alone. Now, not everyone was possessed by an unclean spirit in that crowd, but just exactly how clean were their spirits? Maybe they enjoyed the things Jesus was preaching against, or maybe they profited off them in some way. Perhaps Jesus' teaching was making some in the crowds feel uncomfortable. After all, if Jesus' teaching and preaching were actually true, then it would clearly follow that they must not only repent, but change their actions. Because the good news demands and creates a new way of life. The good news of Jesus demands and creates new life in you and me as well. Jesus' teaching transforms our lives God's, as we follow Christ, we learn that God's good and gracious will is actually more important than our pressing our, than our uh, decisions or wants. We are compelled and encouraged to share our possessions. The Holy Spirit trades our love of money for the love of our enemies. Jesus' words take priority over friends, family, and authorities. It's good. It's very good, but it's also sometimes very tough. 
Jesus is quite clear, though, even if we don't always want to hear his words clearly. If anyone was tempted to miss the point, Jesus clears it up later in Luke chapter 7, verses 46 through 49. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my word and does them, I will show you what he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood rose, the stream broke against the house and it could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one, who, the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Remember that unclean spirit cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Well, we often sound a lot like that unclean spirit. What does this preaching have to do with us or with me? What are you trying to do? Destroy my life, Jesus? If I did what you said, I would be ruined. Well, there's only one thing in, that Jesus will do with an entity that responds like that. Jesus casts out the unclean spirit. Last week, I, I mentioned uh, that Luke likes big, bold announcements. Well, Jesus has some bold announcements for the unclean spirits. He essentially says, shut up and get out of here. And Jesus grabs the wicked spirit and hurls it further than a Joe Burrow-tossed pigskin. The, the crowd asks, who is this guy? And what is this word? Well, with the same authority, Jesus will the word is rebuke, the fever of Simon Peter's mother-in-law. Later, Jesus would rebuke many more unclean spirits. He simply says the word, his strong word, and evil and sickness flee. Jesus still today speaks with authority. He has power to cast out demons, sickness, and evil. And he still comes to cleanse. And uh, we can be warned if we want nothing to do with Jesus' preaching, then we will be cast out. However, that's not God's goal. It's certainly not his plan or his wish or desire for us. The, in the story, remember, who was cast out? The demons, the, the unclean spirits. Sickness was cast out. Evil and sickness were cast out, cast out of the people. See, they had spiritual sicknesses, and real sicknesses for that matter, but sicknesses that they could not cure themselves. Otherwise, they wouldn't have come to Jesus for help. Jesus, however, rebuked sickness itself. Jesus cast out the unclean spirits, giving those people freedom they couldn't give themselves. Jesus came, remember, to throw out sin, not to throw out people. Remember that man who was possessed by the unclean spirit? At the end of the story, he's freed. He was cleansed, and so too were many more after him. Jesus rebukes unclean spirit after unclean spirit. He was doing exactly what Isaiah had prophesied. Jesus was proclaiming liberty to the prisoners by attacking unclean spirits and illness, not by attacking people or parties. He cast out the evil inside of all humankind. And so we remember that Jesus certainly does not wish to cast you or I out either. No, what Jesus wants is clear. He wants to cleanse us of what is bad through the good news. And so that means something freeing. It means that we don't have to hide from our sins or from our suffering or illness for that matter. You can, you can bring sickness and evil to Jesus, and he will throw them out, rebuking the evil, but embracing you. And I hope and pray that we reflect that mission of our Savior uh, in our own lives and here at Grace as well, a people and a place where sinners can come openly, honestly, bringing their problems, problems beyond them, problems too big for them, or maybe we should say problems too big for us to solve on our own. We can bring those problems and that uncleanness before our Savior. 
Because here, in church, but also in confessing sins to one another, even outside of these walls, we can find forgiveness and freedom in our Savior. Still today, Jesus is here to set people free, to proclaim liberty to the prisoners, to tell you, your sins no longer condemn you, they no longer control you. You are not of evil, you are mine. Jesus does have the authority. Jesus has the power to cleanse us. He can power wash us by water and the word, for instance. Baptism promises you and I the forgiveness of sins. It is an eternal washing. He washes away even the most sinful and serious stains. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he power washes the world that he comes into contact with. And yet, uh, in Luke chapter 4, it's not complete, because the story ends rather surprisingly. Jesus leaves Capernaum, even when things seem to be going swimmingly well, because, and we know this, the complete casting of evil cannot be found in Capernaum. It can't be found even in Cincinnati. The complete casting out of evil can only be found further down the road, not at Capernaum, but at Golgotha. The true casting out of evil takes place at the cross and at the empty grave. And so Jesus, despite great success and positive results, he keeps moving. He keeps moving to the cross, where sin and sickness and unclearing spirits and all of us will be rebuked once and for all. And that's why we, too, keep returning to the cross, because there we find forgiveness. And in our baptism, we've been connected to that cross, where evil, sickness, and death are cast out, washed out by the powerful cleansing of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.